Number 1. Genesis, in the series, The Picture of God in All 66, by Graham Maxwell, recorded October 1983. Now tonight, Genesis, next time, Exodus. I'm suggesting that as you reread Exodus, there's some things you might note in particular, many others to be sure. Our question, of course, is what does this say about God? In many and various ways, God has spoken to us in the Old Testament in these last days by the Son, Hebrews 1 says. And we're noting the many and various ways here right from Genesis on. And the truth that he's trying to talk to us about is primarily the truth about himself. God does not ask us to trust him as a stranger. Moreover, he's been accused of being unworthy of our trust. And so God has not simply said, yes, I can be trusted. He has demonstrated that he can be trusted over a long period of time and under a great variety of circumstances, some of them very difficult. It would seem to me that the demonstration of his trustworthiness under very difficult circumstances would be the most convincing demonstration. You know, the way a man treats his friends doesn't tell us too much. But the way he treats enemies under very difficult circumstances is a great revelation. And therefore, many parts of the Bible that are often um, largely ignored because they don't seem to be telling us about deeds to be done and sins to be shunned, just a record of God's involvement in our human predicament, uh, we leave them out. But all Scripture inspired of God is profitable, and I find some of those difficult stories the most profitable and not to be wasted. Next time in Exodus, God comes down on Sinai to reveal himself to his people. And he, he terrifies them. There's wind and earthquake and fire and a very great smoke and lightning. And the people are so afraid that terrified they stand there and say all that the Lord has said we will do, which wasn't worth much, because 40 days later, look what they were doing when the sound died away. But if we follow the policy we mentioned last time, of remembering all 66 books, because we've read the Bible through before, as we look at each book, what about one of the last books in the Bible, 1 John, which says, God is love, and perfect love casts out all fear. There is no fear in love. Fear has to do with punishment. Why did God do something that would terrify the children of Israel at the foot of Sinai? Why would he show himself in that way? Why would he thunder? Why not come down on Mount Sinai and say the gracious things he said on the Mount of Olives? Softly, you know, still small voice. Does it say anything about God that he would raise his voice so on Sinai? And was it the Father or was it the Son? Is the Father the one who talks so loudly and the Son is the still small voice? Notice as you read again that Moses stood amidst the terrified people and said, there is no need to be afraid. Another possible question, since love cannot be commanded, the things that God desires the most, our love and our trust cannot be commanded or produced by force, then why did he give the Ten Commandments? It's explained very clearly right in Moses' time and many other times in the Bible, that to keep the Ten Commandments is to love God and love your neighbor as yourself, and you can't command that anyway. Then why would he give us the Ten Commandments? And if God prizes our freedom so highly, why has he made so much use of law, endless laws, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy? Why has he made so much use of law? For us Adventists, that has been a very... Uh, important question. That was the issue at the Minneapolis General Conference in 1888, and um, in many ways has not been thoroughly resolved yet. Though I think Ellen White in subsequent years resolved it very beautifully, if one uh, uh, prizes her writings highly. Now, in the light of a verse I mentioned last time, John 16, 26, where Jesus said, let me tell you plainly about the Father, there is no need for me to pray the Father for you, for the Father loves you himself. In the light of that clear statement of the Son of God himself, why in Exodus does he give them the whole priestly system of intercession and mediation, someone in between? Now, to me, that's the ultimate question in the Bible, of enormous consequence to us. 
you might like to look ahead quickly to be sure our versions all read alike. Would you look at John 16, 26? In anticipation of reading Exodus for next time, then Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy. Look at John 16, 26. Maybe my version is the only one that reads this way, although I know it isn't. John 16, let's take 25 and 26. Jesus is talking to his chosen representatives to build the Christian church after his departure. And he says to them, just before he'd, he goes out to die, I have said this to you in figures. What do you have for figures? Parables, symbols, uh, figures of speech, proverbs. Yeah, the Old Testament is full of them, isn't it? And so is the New. How about Hebrews? How about Revelation? And other places. I've been talking to you in, in figures, in symbols. The time is coming, the hour is coming when I shall no longer speak to you in this way, in figures, but I will tell you plainly of the Father. Oh, it would be nice to read that, wouldn't it? Uh, the God himself speaking plainly of his Father. Next verse. In that day when I talk plainly, you will ask in my name, and I do not say to you that I shall pray the Father for you, for the Father himself loves you. And in verse 29, his disciples said, now you're speaking plainly. So how soon did he, he said, the hour is coming when I'll speak to you plainly. He did it right away, didn't he? And the disciples said, now you're speaking plainly. Now what did he speak that was so plain? There is no need for me, I will not. Pray the Father for you. Good Speed in 1923 translated that, there is no need for me to intercede with the Father for you. Why? Because the Father loves you himself. But who gave us the whole system in the Old Testament of Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy? Well, 1 Corinthians 10.4 says the one who led Israel in the wilderness was Christ. Christ gave that whole system and then he says here, there's no need for it. Well, would that not be a legitimate question to raise while reading Exodus? In the light of what Jesus says in person to the disciples years later, how do we understand what he gave us in the book of Exodus? Is it a contradiction? Not likely. But it certainly invites us to consider the meaning. Notice in Exodus how the people requested that there be somebody in between. And we should discuss that. Is it not true that they said, don't let God speak to us lest we die? You speak to him, you be in between? Do note that. And then note how God talked to Moses as his friend. Now it's numbers coming up that says he talked to Moses face to face as a man speaks to his friend. But it's implicit all through these books that there was no one between God and Moses. How about Abraham in Genesis this time? We should note that. Another question for next time. What about the ten plagues? Why would God use such a method? Are these to be compared with the seven last plagues? When God pours out his, quote, wrath. What was the purpose of the ten plagues? What can we learn about that? I mean, why lice and flies and the river Nile and frogs and the firstborn? Why did he pick on those things? And we can put that in its historical setting and it's very significant. It wasn't to punish them, it was to reveal something to them. So that some of them would trust the true God rather than the God of the Egyptians. But what about the firstborn? Did they die because they were bad boys? Some of them may have been one month old. Um, why, would, why would he kill them? What would that say to us about our God? And then, in the same section of Exodus, who hardened Pharaoh's heart? Do note that on the way through. His hardening is described in three different ways by the same author. And I'm sure he knew what he was doing. Uh, they all mean the same thing. And then on Sinai again, the reference to God's glory looking like fire is most significant, I believe. So there are a number of things in Exodus that uh, I think are of great theological consequence, and uh, there are many others besides these that uh, you might give special attention to when rereading that book. But now coming to Genesis, 
Everybody's familiar with Genesis because we so often make resolutions at the beginning of each year to um, read the Bible faithfully every morning early. And after weeks of prayer, we make similar resolutions. It's why so many people are very familiar with the first few books in the Bible. But you know, you get into Chronicles and all the genealogies, and it, uh, some people get a little weary. We all know the story of creation. But in a few pages, Joseph is dead in his coffin. Begins with a marvelous picture and ends with death. Of course, how many years are covered by that book? Well, when did they go into captivity? When did they come out? Uh, do we know those dates? If you look in the King James, there'll be dates at the top of the center column, but uh, Bishop Usher put those in and you know, we don't normally attribute to too much authority to bishops, uh, do we? <laughs> so um, those were all added, very thoughtfully added. Sometimes the Exodus is dated around 1400 B.C. and the days of Abraham around 1800 B.C. If creation was 4000 B.C., that's Bishop Usher's date, isn't it? Then look how many years are covered by Genesis, 4000 to, to 1800 B.C., uh, hundreds, thousands of years covered in this one book. The picture's magnificent in the beginning, then sin comes in, God announces his plan to save the deterioration of the human race until every man's imagination was evil and the flood comes. After the flood, the Tower of Babel is built. Apparently the flood didn't win many souls, did it? It just scared people. Why did they build the tower? Because they didn't believe in God? Or because they were scared of God and thought he'd probably try to drown them again? So it wasn't that they were not believers in God, it's that they had the wrong picture of God. So they built the tower. And then did you notice the, the decline in length of life? It's, it's precipitous, isn't it? And uh, I remember the first time I went through, I took a pencil and in the margin, I wrote the ages of those patriarchs. And uh, if, if life was shortening at that rate now, We'd all be gone. Um, you mean drop a hundred years in a generation until we get down to three score years and ten. Though Abraham lived longer, didn't he? Well into his second century. In fact, have you reflected on how old Sarah was when the king looked at her and thought, how beautiful, I'd like to have her. How old was she? Ninety? Older? Isn't that incredible that at that age, Sarah still looks so splendid? That's interesting to think about. Although when Abraham received the promise of the baby, he looked at Sarah and said, there's no way we can have a baby. And then he looked at himself and said, absolutely, there's no way. You remember? And yet the king looked at Sarah and thought, that's gorgeous. <laughs> I'd like to have Sarah. So um, is it that people matured later in life those days? For those of us who can use patriarchs and prophets, Ellen White comments, no, we've always matured at the same rate. It's just we didn't uh, deteriorate so quickly thereafter. Then the story of Abraham, and then the captivity in Egypt, and then Joseph in the coffin. Now, what does Genesis say to us most significantly about God? We suggested in our previous meetings that in order to understand the meaning of something, we need to recreate the original setting. Uh, what setting would you create for um, Creation Week? I mean, who was watching? Any of us? Not even Adam and Eve. They appeared as visitors on Friday. In fact, that first Sabbath, they were just visitors. And it wasn't their seventh day at all. A uh, man's seventh day is Thursday. So if you want to go by the weekly cycle and say... The biggest argument for the Seventh-day Sabbath is we've obviously been designed to worship every seventh day. Um, it won't work. Uh, we should worship on Thursday. Uh, God and the universe celebrated that first Sabbath, and we were visitors. And then God said, I suggest you keep the same day we did. Uh, he started it. It really was the Lord's Day way back then, wasn't it? And then he gave it to man thereafter. But who was watching? Is there any indication as to what the setting was. We were not watching. We have to read the record. Does the Bible refer to people looking on? 
Well, you remember we considered um, the last book in the Bible, the war up in heaven in Revelation 12. The angels already divided in their loyalty to God. And Satan was cast out. Is he already God's enemy before creation? Well, who approached Adam and Eve in the garden and began to undermine God's reputation right there in the garden? He's already the deceiver and the accuser, and he's described as the serpent in Revelation, isn't he? So it would appear that loyal angels and disloyal angels, the individuals described elsewhere in the Bible as the sons of God who watched and sang for joy and agreed with God that it was very good. Uh, all of them were watching. It was a very public event, the creation of our world. Is that why maybe since so many were watching and there were so many important questions in the minds of the onlooking universe that God took six days to do it? Why, why do you think he took six days, do you suppose? I mean, he could have done it with a snap of his fingers and may have created all the rest of the universe that way. Why our world in six days? I mean, if nobody was watching, he might as well have just snapped his fingers. Is it because people were watching? And they'd heard Satan's charges that God is arbitrary, exacting, vengeful, unforgiving, and severe, that he is not respectful of the freedom of his intelligent creatures, and that he's very selfish in the exercise of his creative power. Think of the desires of the adversary at that time, clearly described elsewhere in the Bible. Now, perhaps we shouldn't take time to look at it now because Genesis is a long book, but when we come to these books, we should. Let, let me cite verses. In Isaiah 14, 12 to 14, in Ezekiel 28, verses 2, 3, 6, 13 and following, do you remember how Lucifer says, I will be like the Most High, I will sit in the sides of the north, he sets himself up as God. You think of other verses in the Bible? You see, Lucifer has wanted to be thought of and worshipped as God. Now, the clearest evidence for this is in Matthew 4, 8 to 10, when Lucifer, we shouldn't call him Lucifer anymore. Lucifer means bearer of light. He is a bearer of lies, not light. So Lucifer does not fit. The only one we can call Lucifer is Christ. And as you know, that is one of the names of Christ. So we never call him Lucifer in the Latin. We call him Morning Star. Now, if we did it in Greek, it would be Phosphorus, but that would seem strange, wouldn't it? To say Phosphorus did this and that. Sometimes language um, uh, confuses us rather than helping us. Lucifer, Phosphorus, Light Bearer, Morning Star are all the same word. Just as Cephas, Peter, Rock are all the same word. And when we get to Matthew, we should consider the significance of that. Let's not let language be a problem to us. Satan means the adversary. That would be a proper name. Satan wishes to be worshipped as God, and he said to his creator in the wilderness of temptation, if you will get down on your knees and worship me, I'll give you this planet. I don't want it anyway. In fact, who would when you think of the rest of the universe? This is a very insignificant little a blue marble, and it's not in the best condition anyway. I don't think he wants it. He doesn't care for his followers. He just cares about himself. Can you imagine a created being asking his God to get down on his knees and worship him? So that's pretty clear that he wants to be worshipped as God. In Revelation 13, verse 4, is he not finally worshipped? The whole world will worship him in the end. He will achieve his goal except for the few people who remain loyal to Jesus and keep the commandments of God, Revelation 14, 12 and 12, 17. Uh, that's the significance of those verses. There will be a few at the end who remain loyal to the true Christ while the rest of the world worships the substitute Christ, the false Christ, Satan, who it says masquerades as an angel of light, doesn't it? As well in scripture, 2 Corinthians eleven fourteen, He masquerades as an angel of light. But he does not bring light, he brings lies. But the stunning thing is that the father of lies, John 8, 44, as Jesus called him, accuses God of lying in Genesis, doesn't he? 
He says, God has lied to you. You will not die. So here the father of lies is accusing our heavenly father of lying. Now who has told the truth? God or the former light bearer? And the angels watched for evidence upon which to decide. Now this work of his as accuser is mentioned in Job, isn't it? One and two. And in Zechariah 3 and Revelation 12, 10. It's not just a few places. The involvement of the whole universe and the leadership of the adversary who used to be a covering angel who stood in the very presence of God, as did his son. And that's the one who led the opposition. As to other people looking on, in Job 38, 4 to 7, it says the sons of God watched the creation and celebrated. And of course, 1 Corinthians 4, 9, see all these verses we'll come to later on as we go through in the books, it says we're a spectacle to angels and to men. And the Greek word for spectacle is theatron, from which we get theater. And that's where it comes earth theater of the universe, you know, that's, that's the verse right there in scripture. We are, a, we are a theater, we are a spectacle, we are a platform, and the whole universe has been watching. And that's why, as I mentioned one of the previous visits, in Ephesians and in Colossians, it says that Christ died to make peace throughout the universe, to bring unity and harmony, because the war began and spread throughout the universe the war will end successfully and there once again will be peace. So, the many references in the Bible to the setting for creation week. The whole universe is watching when God says, let there be light. Would this add any significance to his uh, maybe taking so much time? You know, why not just say this, I'll have a nice world. I don't have a text for this, but anybody have any idea what the devil did when he was cast out of heaven? hoping to hold the allegiance of the fallen angels and their worship of him as God. I mean, one of the greatest evidences that God is God is that he has creative power. If the fallen Lucifer could not demonstrate creative power, how could he hold the loyalty of the angels who united with him? I wonder what he did when he was cast out. Now we have information that he has great power. He is a a diligent student of the laboratory of nature. He, he can do many things. He cannot create life. He's not a creator. He's a manipulator. And I wonder what he did. Probably the Lord knew he'd have enough difficulty understanding what he did put in the 66, so he did not add further information. But when the first pictures came back from the moon, I couldn't help thinking in the back of my mind. That's a bit of a mess out there, isn't it? I would describe that as chaos. Wouldn't you? I mean, there's no lawns and trees and rivers. <laughs> I mean, the moon is, is just raw. It, it's in the condition that this world was in before day one. The Hebrew says it was tohu avohu, emptiness and wasteness. Isn't that the moon? And the pictures from Mars and Jupiter, they don't look much better, do they? I wonder who messed up our solar system. Don't have a text. But it looks chaotic out there. Sometimes we describe creation week as from chaos to cosmos in six days, don't we? Cosmos means order and beauty. In fact, the word cosmetic comes from cosmos. A cosmetic is anything you use to make yourself look in good order. Normally, when we get out of bed in the morning and look in the mirror, we are faced with chaos. And then we diligently uh, try to restore ourselves to cosmos. Don't condemn cosmetics or you'll have to come out in public next time in a perfectly chaotic state. You can't use a comb. A comb is an instrument of, of cosmos. There are all kinds of cosmetics that we use. The question is, do your cosmetic devices make you look more orderly and more beautiful? I mean, some people work at it so hard when they're through, it seems look they're worse than when they first stepped out of bed. You know, this is a matter of good taste, isn't it? Uh, hopefully we could look in the mirror when we're through and say, that's good. In fact, that's very good, <laughs> as God did at the end of creation week. I think this is a very private matter, what we do to reduce the chaos. And we all have various and sundry little secrets, you know. Things um, go in and out, uh, not always in the right places. It's the men and the women are like, so we, we do things. It's out of kindness to others who have to look at us. 
I think it's very nice to put ourselves in good order. So if somebody says, are you in favor of cosmetics? Don't say yes or no. Say, let me, let me discuss what a cosmetic is. If the result is beautiful, and even God would agree, and God's very kind, you know, even this far from the tree of life, he might say we look nice. You know, we've all deteriorated together, haven't we? Mercifully, so we still look nice to each other. God would like us to look in a state of cosmos. Speaks well of our Heavenly Father, too. Well, chaos, day one. And God said with the whole universe looking on, let there be light. That's all. And there was evening and morning the first day. And then the second day a little more. Then the third and the fourth and the fifth and the sixth. As God in unhurried majesty and drama unfolded his plan for our world. Nobody pushing him around. You don't push God around. God's very gracious. But there are times when he really has to stand on his dignity because there are people who don't revere him. I think that week he took his time. And gradually as our world unfolded, it would seem to me that some things were becoming increasingly clear. Why did he make it so beautiful? A selfish God making it maybe the prettiest place in the universe up to date. How gorgeous the garden. And then he created us people. And he created us free. We know he did. Because to this day we can either love or trust him, or we can hate him and spit in his face. In fact, humans have done it. And by the way, when they spat in Jesus' face, he didn't hit back, did he? So God created us free. We know he did. But then he must have taken the angel's breath away when he said, I will allow Satan to approach these two in the garden. But I won't allow them to be tested more than they're able to bear. He may only approach them at the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Now some say the tree was there to test their obedience. No, in the larger view, the great controversy view, that tree was there to protect them. It was very gracious of God. He said, Satan, I will let him approach you because I value freedom higher than anything else. But I won't let him approach you and harass you all around the garden. He may only approach you at the tree. I suggest you don't go near it. Does that make sense? Patriarchs and Prophets says, Christ and the angels walked with them in the garden and told them all about the great controversy and the fall of Satan, and that he could only approach them at the tree. It was not arbitrary at all. I'm sad when I see statements like that, that it was arbitrary. There's nothing arbitrary about our God. He put it there to protect them. Then it was very foolish of them to wander away. By the way, did Eve sin before she was tempted? Or did Adam sin by letting her go? Well, it doesn't matter. We don't have to date that, do we? Uh, it was a foolish mistake. And at the tree, well, let's come to that a little later, more on the good things in the garden. Why do you think God made us male and female with all the hazards thereunto appertaining? And you think of the history of this thing in the history of the human race. Why do you think he did? I mean, does it say anything about him that he did? Or are all angels that way? There are male angels and female angels. And... No, Jesus said. You remember when they asked whose wife that girl would be who married the seven brothers in order? He said, in the hereafter, we'll be like the angels. You'll be like the angels. It's different. Uh, I sometimes wish Ellen White had said more on this. The only hint she gives that I've read is human beings are of a distinct order. Um, maybe this is the only place in the universe where there are males and females because it really says something about God. If one of Satan's charges was, in fact, the cause of his jealousy, God will not share his creative power with his intelligent uh, children because Satan was not included in the plans to create our world. He was offended by that. What could God do to make it clear that he's willing to share everything with us as far as is possible? Is it not true that God has so designed things that when a man and a woman come together in love, they create little people in their own image? That's about as godlike as we can possibly be and still be creatures, you know. We aren't gods. It's just amazing how... God is almost, well, he's made us as much like God's as he could. We have been created a little lower than, well, the key text says the angels. But you know what the Hebrew says? A little lower than God. 
The Hebrew is me Elohim, as you know. It's, it's a little lower than God. And I guess the translators couldn't imagine that to be true, and they have a little lower than the angels. Um, here, that's coming up in a Sabbath school lesson shortly, I believe. So there'll be a time to discuss that in Sabbath school. We were created a little lower than God. Is there a verse in the Psalms that says, you are all God's little g? Did Jesus quote that? He said, doesn't the Bible say you're God's little g? Trouble is, Lucifer wanted to be God with a big G. Think of all the religious leaders and dictators through the years who have accepted worship as God with a large G. No, that makes no sense. We're mere creatures. But God doesn't rub our creatureliness in. He says, I'd like to treat you like gods, like brothers of my son, like my friends. Ah, that's incredible about our God, isn't it? Of course, when we begin to think of ourselves as God, then he says, I wish you would be reminded once a week that you, you do happen to be created. I don't like to rub it in, but sometimes you do need to remember that. What was given us to remind us that we're not God? The Sabbath, isn't that one of the functions of the Sabbath? I mean, anybody who keeps the Sabbath to be reminded of creation week should never think too much of himself in this respect as to think of himself as God. But on the other hand, Sabbath should remind us that God shared his godlike creative power with us as much as he could, so don't think too little of yourself. And when we sing that hymn about being worms, I mean, don't, don't use that too much. There is one, isn't there? A worm such as I. Um, well, maybe we need to be reminded of that once in a while, but God does not like us to dwell on that much. Too many people think of themselves as worms, and that's why they don't behave in a dignified fashion created in the image of God. Well, now let's see what else happened during creation week. It, it would seem as if on Friday evening, when they celebrated uh, God finishing his work, that all the questions about God had been answered. And they began to keep. Well, who began to keep? God rested the next day, not because he was tired. That word rest is like the rest of an attorney who says, uh, I now rest my case. He doesn't mean I got a lot more evidence, but I'm exhausted. Uh, he means I've done a thorough job, I'm through. Uh, God was not tired. He just stopped what he was doing and did something else. And the first seventh day, God and the universe, the loyal universe, celebrated the magnificent things God had said about himself and what he'd, he desired for his children. Then the next week, According to Exodus, God said to us, remember the Sabbath day and remember what it represents. And as the years went by, he added more and more meanings to the seventh day Sabbath. The Sabbath is designed to remind us of the marvelous revelation of the truth about our God during creation week, plus the Exodus, plus crucifixion week, and many other things. Is the Sabbath arbitrary? It's often described as an arbitrary test of our obedience. If it's arbitrary, it supports the devil's charge that God is arbitrary. The Sabbath is exactly the opposite of arbitrary. It's just surrounded with meanings. The Sabbath reminds us of the truth about our God that is the basis of our freedom and of our trust in him. And if only we kept every seventh day thoughtfully, we, we would never wander away from God. We would know the truth about our God and how he values our freedom and how he wishes to treat us with dignity and respect if we give him half a chance. But now, were all the questions during uh, creation week, were they all answered? What about the charge that God had lied about death being the result of sin? Was there anything said during creation week or demonstrated during creation week that answered that question? Nothing during that week. We have to wait all the way down through the years to crucifixion week to get the answer to that question. And after Jesus died on crucifixion Friday, what was the next day? But Sabbath again. Why didn't he go up on Friday? Why did he wait over Sabbath and go up early Sunday morning? Was it to add the most important reason for keeping the Sabbath in the whole Bible? The seventh day Sabbath reminds us of what happened on crucifixion Friday and the Exodus and uh, creation week and many other things. It is the most meaningful of all our observations, to remember the Sabbath day, to keep it holy, and recall what God revealed about himself. 
But now, going into the details following this in Genesis, um, the issues raised in the Garden of Eden, Adam and Eve there, um, was it just that uh, Adam and Eve disobeyed God and ate the apple and God said, I don't like it when you disobey me. So he threw them out of the garden. He didn't kill them, but he just expelled them. But that made God seem arbitrary, vengeful, unforgiving, and severe. How do you understand what happened at the tree? They disobeyed God, and God said, I told you, in the day you eat thereof, you'll die, but instead of that, I'll just expel you from the garden. They yielded themselves to obey Satan. They chose themselves to do God. What, what do you think of that? Was it more that, as you're saying, that Adam and Eve were confronted with the issues in the great controversy and the war up in heaven? And Adam and Eve, unfortunately, took their stand with the disloyal angels, that God could not be trusted, and they chose to trust the adversary. They took their side with him. So immediately the great controversy was extended to our planet, and they're caught up in the same problem. <laughs> Let's contemplate Adam's decision there. Uh, he, he understands that, that Eve was deceived, and, and I hope he was, it isn't in the record, that he's as generous as the Apostle Paul was. You remember when Paul commented on this? He very generously says, Eve was deceived, but Adam, he knew better. Oh, that was very, very manly of Paul to admit that, because they both were in trouble. But uh, now, you ladies, what would you want your husband to do in the garden? Uh, should Adam have said, well, that's too bad, but um, God can give me another wife, so. What Adam said was, if Eve must die, let me die with her. Now, isn't that the noble thing to say, at least on your anniversary? Uh, how could you fault Adam there? Um, should he have said, this is very sad, but um, I'm sure God can get me another woman? What would be admirable there? Well, should he have said, well, I've enjoyed living with Eve, but now I guess she'll have to be cast out. But there'll be a plan to save her. In the meantime, God can give me another wife. We don't know if she would have been cast out. Yeah. I mean, God would have still died for her. But could she have stayed with Adam? If Adam had remained loyal and Eve disloyal, she'd have been outside the gate and he'd have been inside and they'd have had visiting privileges, perhaps. <laughs> I mean, now the Bible doesn't discuss this. It, it's, it's fun to think about it. In fact, just, just a wee bit of sanctified speculation fires up the imagination you know, and helps us uh, recreate the scene in mind. So I like, I like to do that. Now, of course, we always have to come back to what is actually recorded. Adam cast his lot with Eve. But now, do you think Adam expected that God would go through with, in the day you eat thereof, you'll die? Or do you think Adam thought, as I know this gracious person who walks with us in the garden in the cool of the day, he, he won't do that. He'll forgive us. Surely he'll forgive us. Well, he was right, wasn't he? But he thought that forgiveness would take care of it. In other words, even Adam shared the, the very legal understanding of the plan of salvation that has benighted the human race for such a long time, that our problem with our Heavenly Father is a legal problem that is cared for by forgiveness. Whereas, you see, sin is not something recorded in a book to be stamped forgiven from time to time, and all is well. Sin is something that happens in people. And even though we be forgiven, we're changed. And we need to be healed. Adam and Eve were forgiven, you know, when God came looking for them in the garden. He looked for them with love in his heart and forgiveness. He's forgiveness personified. God forgave them, but they were changed. And they had to be cast out of the garden and put under discipline, and you know what's happened ever since. And I, I'm inclined to think that, that Adam was making the mistake that so many have made. The only thing bad about sin is it gets you in legal trouble with the one in charge. And the plan of salvation is designed to give you a way of escape from your legal predicament. You see, having broken the law, you are now under sentence and penalty. You are in legal trouble. But if only the one in charge could find some way to forgive you, you'd no longer be in trouble. 
And so the plan of salvation through the years has been preoccupied with forgiveness rather than healing the damage done. When Jesus talked to Nicodemus, he didn't say, Nicodemus, unless you be forgiven, you'll never enter the kingdom. He said, unless you have a new heart and a right spirit, you'll never see the kingdom. And I find that running all through the Bible. And of course, God was very gracious. Um, Adam didn't understand this yet. Weren't the things the angels didn't understand? Weren't the things the whole universe, the most brilliant beings in the universe, did not understand until Jesus came? And most particularly, until Jesus died. They did not understand. In fact, what is the death of which God warned Adam and Eve in the garden? Had he ever seen death? He'd never seen death. Had the angels ever seen death? So God's very gracious if we don't have information. He doesn't demand understanding without information. And so he patiently, graciously dealt with angels and men until the day would come when we would see, not in words, but in awful demonstration, the death that is the result of sin. How many times has the universe seen that kind of death? What's the first death in Genesis, in the Bible? What's the first death that occurs? Okay, some say when the lamb was killed. Would anybody suggest an earlier time? Well, some have suggested when God brought them the skins, he probably had to kill some animals and do something with their carcasses when he brought the skins. I, I don't think we need to worry about that. When Jesus fed the disciples fish for breakfast on the beach, was he standing there with rod and line, you know, <laughs> trying to catch some fish? And uh, Breakfast will be ready soon, but I haven't caught all the fish yet. He created the breakfast on the beach, didn't he? Easy for our God to create the skins to, to clothe Adam and Eve. I don't think that's the problem. The first death they saw out of the universe saw was the death of the lamb, wasn't it? And I can imagine Adam killing that lamb. What do you think he killed it with? With a rock or something? He'd never killed anything before. How do you kill a lamb? Would you know how hard to hit it? And I suspect being, you know, so close to the perfection in the beginning, uh, this was very hard for him to do and he didn't hit it hard enough. And then a little harder. And finally blood appeared. Remember the first time you had an experience like that? Did it make you sick? It did me. And Adam may have turned to God and said, God, I can't go through with this. It's making me sick. And God says, that's the whole idea. May it always make you sick. And you'll get the point that the consequence of sin is very serious. And somehow it even involves the death of an innocent party, though he didn't give them the details of that. They learned that more and more. Later on, they were able to kill these animals. Um, in fact, Josephus says people used to come and watch as the animals were dismembered and prepared. It was a great thing to watch, almost as in a butcher shop. I remember as a boy in England watching them prepare the butter. It wasn't very sanitary. There'd be this huge mound of butter, and you'd go in and ask for a pound. They'd take two paddles. They'd whack off some with great skill. And you remember doing this on the, on the wooden block? I can hear the sound of it right now as they'd make the shape and wrap it up in paper. Very skillful. Well, they used to cut the animals up and burn them, and they'd say, God, we hope you love the smell, and you'll send rain on our crops. They were missing the whole point. The idea was when they killed those animals, it, it would really upset them. Well, that's one death. Did the angels turn to God and say, is that the death that is the result of sin? Somebody killing a lamb? And God would say, no, that's not the one yet. What's the next death? The murder of Abel? And they would say, well, is that the death you mean? People will kill each other. No, that's not the one I warned you of. Yes? There in the garden, wasn't it the, the idea was dying thou shalt die? Yes. And that's the death that Christ eventually stood in man's place for. Yes, now the dying thou shalt die is interesting because uh, we think of that as if we were reading English. Uh, in the Hebrew, dying thou shalt die means you will definitely die, is the idiom. Not you'll slowly die. Um, now they didn't immediately die that death. Now, later on, we have information more and more as to why they didn't. Uh, did not God walk with them in the garden and talk face to face with them and they were perfectly safe? How about in the book of Exodus? Were they able to see God face to face? Even his friend Moses? Moses said, God, show me your glory. Show me your face. 
And God said, no man can see my face and live. Now, did he mean if I catch you peeking, I'll kill you? That's like if I catch you touching that tree, I'll kill you. No, it's very clear in, in um, Exodus that's not the case. Because a little later on, Moses begged still more, didn't he? And God said, I'll put you in a cleft in the rock. I'll put my hand over you and show you my, I remember as a small boy growing up with the King James, my hinder parts. And I always wondered what God's hinder parts looked like. And I searched to see if Moses reported. And of course, there is no report, is there, in there. When he came down from the mountain, he came with a description of God's character, the kind of person he was. But that wasn't all. He also shone so brightly with the reflected glory of God that the people couldn't look at him. And he wore a veil out of consideration for the people until the glory died away. And I think the message there is the glory that surrounds the person of God is very real. Christ veiled the dazzling splendor of his divinity that human beings might come to know God without being consumed. If God had come in his glory to save us, his very presence would have consumed the people he had come to save. It's a natural consequence. So is it not true that when Adam and Eve sinned, God immediately veiled his life-giving glory. And did they not feel a chill? Why did he bring them the clothing? We're told to protect them from the extremes of heat and cold. I once learned that happened after the flood, that so long as there was the, the water around the earth, the temperature was very even when they really didn't need those skins, did they? No, we are more dependent on the life-giving glory of God. This earth is a dark place, and God brought them these skins to protect them from the extremes of heat and cold right after they sin. I'm inclined to think that the merciful veiling of God's life-giving glory may have changed our planet more than the flood. And that's why so many uh, scientists today are finding things that can't be explained by the flood. Well, don't blame everything on the flood. Some terrible changes occurred before the flood. And the flood buried a lot of them. Now they're digging them up. So if we conservative Bible people can come up with a perfectly good model to explain all these things that seem to be so old. All these radioactive problems that are hard to understand. You know, um, our earth was bathed in this incredible, life-giving, glorious power of God in the beginning. And man lived in it. And we will once again. But when man is out of harmony with God, this same life-giving glory becomes destructive. And this glory looks like fire, Sinai says, and many other places in the Bible. Note that, coming up. In the end, God unveils his life-giving glory, for all have decided. Those who are in harmony are glorified by this. The others are consumed by the glory of him who is love. It's not arbitrary. It's a natural consequence. Did we get hints of this right away in, in Genesis? Well, when's the next death? Would that be the flood? Well, there may have been many murders before that, for sure. But when God drowned all but eight, did the angels turn to God and say, Is that what you mean in the day you eat thereof you will die? If you disobey me, I'll drown you. And the devil, when he caught his breath after the flood, said, Absolutely, that's the whole point. God talks about love and freedom. Actually, if you don't obey him, he'll drown you. Look, he drowned all those people. Mothers, little babies, their pets, everything. How can you love and trust such a God? And listen to his talk about freedom. And soon thereafter, there's the story of Sodom and Gomorrah. So evidently, God will not only say, if you don't obey me, I'll drown you. If you don't obey me, I'll burn you. And if you so much as turn back and look at the home where you reared your family all these years, and I say you shouldn't, I'll turn you into a pillar of salt. And the devil says, I told you God is arbitrary, vengeful, unforgiving, and severe. And his key texts are the stories we give our children. So we had better take those stories back. They're our key texts, not his, but how do we interpret them? Any other deaths? Abraham, take your son and sacrifice him. Is that the death that is the result of sin? Uh, maybe that's a little closer because it is representative and there are some amazing similarities between that and the death of Christ. Oh, now there's the death in nature, too. Is that the death that is the result of it? It's one of the consequences, isn't it? Yeah, the, all the death all around them. 
Look at all the deaths in the Old Testament and all the deaths in history. If any one of those answered the question that the devil raised, God has lied to you about death being the result of sin. If all those other deaths would answer the question, why would Jesus need to die? They didn't answer the question. As a matter of fact, those deaths often puzzled people when they didn't put them in the full setting. And they became afraid of God. And when Jesus came to live among these people, he lived among obedient people, many of whom were afraid of him, which turns people into rebels, and many of them engaged in rejecting him and torturing him to death. Is it not true only one person has ever died the death that is the ultimate consequence of sin? And that's God himself. God did not ask us to prove the truthfulness of his word. He came and did it himself. What does that say about him? Now, what do you think about that death? What is the death that is the result of sin? Did God burn his son to death? Did he torture him to death? Well, the most widely held view is that the penalty for sin is to be tortured in sulfurous flames for eternity. Isn't that right? That's the most widely held view. Is Jesus being tortured in sulfurous flames for eternity? He went back to heaven on Sunday. Well, let's try another view. The penalty for sin is that you will be tortured in sulfurous flames as long as you deserve, and then you will die. And if you've not been too serious a sinner, you will not suffer so long. But if you've been a very bad sinner, you will suffer a long time. If Jesus bore our sins, then he would have to suffer a long, long time, would he not? He died on Friday afternoon, and he went to heaven on Sunday. Well, maybe we're not paid up. Maybe he came out of the tomb too soon. How do we understand that death? You can see how really the answer on Calvary needs to be read right back into Genesis. It seems to me the best preparation for the answer is to start in Genesis and note the question. God says, in the day you eat of, you will die. The devil said, that's a lie, you won't die. Then there were many, many deaths. Shouldn't that answer the question? Evidently not. But when Jesus died and rose on Sunday and went to heaven and asked the angels, they said, yes, now it's clear. And they've been telling him ever since, that's clear, you're holy and just and righteous and good. Uh, evidently, they were satisfied with the answer. Because that's the greatest question of all, not what does God do to his friends. What does he do to his enemies and to his disobedient children? That affects the quality of our relationship with him and our anticipations for the future more than anything else. Well, the question is raised in Genesis. And uh, it will be the question in the background all through the 39 books till we come to the Gospels. He died to prove that God is just. That's the only reason we can really come up with. He was justified in the sight of all creation. Did the whole creation say, as Jesus died, God, you are just? Did everybody agree? In the final analysis, all of creation will agree. How does the death of Christ prove that God is just? Well, that's the question that runs all the way through. But certainly the devil says it, this is unjust. God has not told the truth. So let's hold that in abeyance. It's the most important question. The prophets deal with it, the whole sacrificial system. So let's hold that as, as we go through. Any other questions about this? Yes. Christ did not bemoan his sufferings while he was in them, except for when he was finally on the cross. He said, Why hast thou forsaken me? That seemed the most agonizing aspect of the crucifixion, his separation from God. Well, uh, in case some of you never come back again, um, to me this is the most important thing in the whole Bible. You see, we know that sin results in death. But how is God involved in it? Did God say in the garden, you either obey me or I'll kill you? And it won't be an injection as in Texas. It won't be the gas chamber, it won't be hanging, it won't be shooting as in Utah. I will find the slowest, most painful way I know how. Now I am a God of love, and I want freedom in my home. But I must let you know that if you don't cooperate, that's what I'll do to you. Now there can be no freedom in the home. If, you, if the father in the home is threatening the whole family with painful extermination, there's no way you can have freedom. So God is going to clear this up, you know. And he didn't clear it up with the flood, or with Sodom and Gomorrah, or with the she-bears, or all those other deaths, because those looked as if God did do that sort of thing. Then when Jesus died, as you said, 
did the father lay a hand on his son. The son said, my God, my God, why have you given me up, forsaken me? And he died. But we have to pick up many, many places, as you know, through the 39 books that will approach Calvary like this. And let's not miss anything. Yes? Doesn't Eugene White state that some sinners will die at birth Yes, that's right. With Satan dying in the end. That's right. Now, if you could take Alan White seriously, she says, in the fires in the end, and Peter says the fire will be so intense the very elements will melt with fervent heat, some live longer in the fire than others. If God is the one who's executing, then God is the one who is torturing. And is that to do anybody any good? No, because they die afterwards. Who only would get the message? The ones who remain, the good ones. And what would the message be to them? I mean it when I say, you either love me or I'll do to you what I'm doing out there. And that's the end of the obedience that springs from love, trust, without fear. It's the end of it. So this has to be answered. And the greatest price conceivable was paid to clear this up. And we're not going to see any deaths in the Old Testament that clear it up. We'll see a lot of deaths. We'll see God drowning all but eight. We ought to come to that quickly here. Any other comment on this, though? God is going to destroy sinners out of mercy. Yes, well, if he does it out of mercy, why does he do it so slowly? That means he's not doing it. There's no way you could say it is merciful to slowly burn people to death. And you think now of our, of our Adventist belief, shared by a few others, that the soul is mortal. By the way, where's an excellent verse for that in Genesis? God breathed into man the breath of life, and man began to live. Or man became a living being, man became a living creature. How did your versions read on that? Most of the modern ones are doing it, and that's the Hebrew, nephesh. Nephesh is the person, even the blood in his veins. Rabbi Olinsky explained, uh, having um, uh, translated the Torah into English, a work that's now more complete, he explained to Newsweek and Time magazine reporters. He said, you notice we've dropped the word soul in our Jewish translation. Because he said, people think of soul as something that can be wafted off to heaven without any body to enjoy the music, without a nervous system, and so on. He said, there's nothing in the Bible about that kind of an essence. In the Bible, the word nephesh, translated soul in the King James, means the whole person, even the blood in his veins. And I hope your version reads that way. That's when man began to live. It is very biblical to believe in the mortality of the soul. When you put a mortal person in fire so intense, the very elements melt with fervent heat, how long does he live? Just two lungs full of superheated air and he's gone. But some live longer in that intense heat. That would mean that God supernaturally keeps them alive so they'll hurt. You see, if he's the executioner, he is a cruel torturer. Then we've got to know how God is involved in the death of the wicked. How could we find out? Because has anybody ever died that death? Yes, only God himself in human form died that death. It is so terrible. How was God involved? Well, one member of the Godhead was dying that death in human form. What were the others doing, the Father and the Holy Spirit? The Old Testament speaks to it, I believe. God would be crying over his son. How can I give you up? How can I let you go? And the son is crying, my God, my God, how can you let me go? Why have you forsaken me? And there's so much in the Bible on that. And I think unless that's cleared up, we will have a relationship with God to which we may call very loving. But there's a lot of fear down deep in there. Because you see, if you don't obey God, you know what he's going to do to you. It's no mercy killing. That's euthanasia, mercy killing. God does not practice euthanasia. He tortures people slowly to death. Uh, that needs to be clarified. Ellen White says, more millions of people have been turned against God by the doctrine of eternal torment than any other teaching. In fact, she says, the thought that God would claim to be love, don't try to make sense of it, it doesn't make sense. Then what are we going to do? Well, we should be in Matthew and Mark and Luke and John rather than Genesis, but doesn't Genesis raise the question? 
that's answered in the Gospels. How did Jesus die? The only one who died as a sinner. He was made to be sin, though he knew no sin. And he died the death of a sinner. So we need to go to the cross to look. Let's look, though, at some other things quickly. Um, why do you think God expelled them on their first offense? Do your parents do that? If we were expelled on the first offense, how long would we have been home? Is God less kind than our parents? Our parents forgive and let us stay, even if we threaten to leave, so long as we come back by supper, all's well. Mother will still... Did you ever threaten to run off from home? You know, by supper you get hungry, you, you hurry back, and mother's very kind. Here, you're going to have some supper after all. Our mother's kinder than our God. God says, out, out. Put an angel there to keep them out. Why would he do that? do you think? How would a child understand that? Prior to them partaking of the fruit of the tree of knowledge, they had nothing to contrast with God's glory. Afterwards, after their eyes were opened and they knew sin, they could see both sides of it and God's glory would have consumed them. So, if God expelled them for that reason, otherwise they would have been destroyed. Now, wouldn't this bring in what the two others have said about the effect on nature? Didn't they see death in nature? I mean, uh, they were cast out of the beautiful garden to see in many and various ways the consequences of their sin. Though they didn't fully understand, they could see that sin led to something very undesirable. It even led to murder. And I, wouldn't it all be part of a, it's a program of education? It was better for them outside to learn the lessons. Ellen White's comment is that for a thousand years, Adam grieved over the results of what he had done. And uh, you think what happened during those thousand years, and he realized that had he been loyal, it wouldn't have happened. So it would be part of the instruction, wouldn't it, to see the results outside. So whom God loves, he disciplines. And as you know, King James says, God chastens those whom he loves. Unfortunately, chasten now means punish. The Greek word is to uh, discipline to instruct even, to treat as a child. The Greek word is paideo, from which we get pedagogue. Pedagogues don't just spank, they instruct, uh, in the, at the present time anyway. Um, so whom God loves, he disciplines, is the correct rendering of that verse, both in Old and New Testament. And part of God's instruction involved their being expelled from the garden. When they begin to realize, when they looked in, did it not remain there till the flood? They looked in and saw all they had lost. And uh, they needed to learn that. So they would take God seriously. Um, let's go on to some other things quickly. When um, Adam and Eve sinned, God came looking for them, you remember. What does it say about God that he said, uh, where art thou, Adam? I thought he could always tell where we were. Don't we tell the children he can see them all the time? Don't tell them this story. He comes hunting, and sometimes if you hide, he won't find you. Adam says to God, we're over here. And God says, oh, thank you. I'm having trouble finding you. Or is it that the response suggested he, he half wanted to be found, maybe? Are there other places in the Bible where God is described almost more like a human being than a God? How about um, in the time of the flood? Doesn't it say uh, it repented God that he'd made man? Does your version read that uh, God was sorry? that he'd created man. What would that say about God? I made this beautiful world and it just hasn't worked out as I'd hoped. I'm sorry I did it. I'll do better next time. So he drowns all but eight to start over again. Is this your picture of God? Well, put some others with it. After the flood, he said, um, go to now, let us go down and see what the sons of men are doing. So he comes down and finds the Tower of Babel. Why, incredible, he hadn't heard about that. And he knocks the top off. Is that the way it is with our God? I thought Proverbs says, if I make my bed in the depths of the ocean, behold, you're there. Nothing can hide us from God. Hebrews uh, says, everything we do is naked and open before the eyes of whom we have to do. When God came to Abraham in Genesis, you remember, to destroy Sodom and Gomorrah? He told Abraham, and he introduced his remarks, you remember, I have come down to see if the reports I have received about Sodom and Gomorrah are correct or not. You see, the angels aren't as good reporters as we thought. So God has to come down personally to check. Is that true? 
Well, then why is it pictured like this? After the flood, why does God say, I'll put my bow in the cloud to remind me not to drown you again? Is God forgetful? Well, in the Patriarchs and Prophets, for example, Ellen White has a lovely comment on the bow in the cloud. She said, it's not as if God would be forgetful, but he often speaks our language, paints pictures we can understand. He always meets people where they are. The whole Bible is a monument to that. And uh, so we look at the bow and remember. He says, I'll look at it too and I'll remember, but don't think I'm forgetful. And when he hunted for Adam and Eve, he didn't mean I have trouble finding people. I really know where you are, but do you want to tell me where you are? I like your thought. Yeah, I'm over here, God. Uh, many places in the Bible where God is described as um, repenting of the evil that he had threatened. Do you remember? We should note those as we go through. Some of you might like to do this. See, things like this really reflect on our picture of God. And you might like to jot down the, the many, many references to this and illustrations of it. God's wrath, for example. You might note those as we go through till we come to Romans where his wrath is explained as his sadly giving people up. It's not like our wrath and anger, but we have to get a lot of accumulated evidence and demonstration in Scripture. And uh, this might be one. Note the places where God talks to us as if he were one of us. Well, didn't he even come actually in human form like one of us? And we looked at him and saw him get tired and get hungry. He was so tired one day, he slept through a storm. That's how tired he was. And some people said, that can't be God. So because God presents himself to us as a human, so we can understand, don't make a human out of him. It just speaks very well of our God. He's such a skillful teacher. He meets us where we are. He speaks a language we can understand. He even runs grave risks of being misunderstood. Think of what he's done to get our attention from time to time. And we say, that doesn't sound like God. No, but we needed it. And God is willing to do it. And I find all those places speaking well of God rather than the contrary. But let's note others as time goes on. Some say the reason why in the Pentateuch we have these pictures of God is that Moses didn't know God very well. Would you agree from these early books? Next week is one of the best places in Exodus to note whether Moses knew God very well. I've already mentioned it. When the people misunderstood the thunder and the lightning and were scared, what did Moses say? There is no need to be afraid. Don't tell me he didn't know God very well. And when God said to Moses, I'm sick and tired of these people. Let me destroy them. Step aside. I'll make a great nation of you. What did Moses say? Oh, God, you couldn't do it. Not as I know you. That would ruin your reputation. The heathen would say, the Egyptians would say, you were able to get your people this far, but you couldn't make it to the promised land. Don't do it, God. I wish we had God's reply, but it's implicit in the context. God said, you're absolutely right, Moses, but who else knows me that well? How about in Genesis? Is there a similar conversation with Abraham? I would maintain that these people knew God very well. Else Moses couldn't have written these things the way he did. He even was able to enter with God into meeting the people where they are and speaking a language they could understand. So I would say Abraham and Moses and Job and others way back then knew God as well as I wish we did with all the light we have. How about the experience with Abraham? I think that's one of the most important things in Genesis. The conversation over Sodom and Gomorrah. When God said, I'm going to destroy Sodom and Gomorrah, shouldn't Abraham have said, well, if that's what you're going to do, I believe it, and that's all there's to it. When God said to Moses, step aside, let me destroy these people and make a great nation of you, shouldn't Moses have said, well, if that's what you want to do, uh, go ahead, who am I to question your inscrutable ways? Some say, real faith in God uh, never asks any questions. Abraham said to God, God, as I know you, you wouldn't destroy Sodom and Gomorrah if there were 50 saints in there, would you? In fact, God, even if there were only 40, uh, even 30, uh, God, I would never presume to be irreverent. But uh, should not the judge of all the earth do what is right? A mere mortal said to God, and God said, I've never heard such impudence. I thought you were a friend of mine. That is the end of our friendship. 
God said, I love that, Abraham. You really are a friend of mine. And I can talk to you face to face with no one in between. You know me. I wouldn't destroy Sodom and Gomorrah if there were ten saints there, even five. But the trouble is, Abraham, I can't even find five. And the ones he saved weren't very good. Remember Lot's wife? And then you remember Lot's two daughters got their father drunk so they could have children. And you remember who the children were? Their descendants became the enemies of the children of Abraham. Boy, what Lot and the girls did caused a lot of trouble. How about Abraham and Hagar? Who are the descendants of Ishmael? The PLO. That's true, isn't it? Boy, Abraham in the hereafter is going to say, I, I should never have done that. But now, does God love the PLO? How about their ancestor? God said, cast Hagar and Ishmael out. And Hagar left with the boy. And she put him under a bush to die. Who came and looked after Ishmael? God sent an angel to look after Ishmael. God loves the PLO and their ancestor, of course. I, it's a marvelous story. You know, we, we tell about how because he didn't have enough faith, they had to expel the, the other members of the family. Finish the whole story to the end. God looked after Hagar and Ishmael. And did he ever win any Moabites? Ruth was a Moabitess and became one of the ancestors of David and Christ. Isn't that incredible? Not to mention loving a prostitute named Rahab. And she became one of the ancestors of Christ. And whose name is listed in Hebrews 11 as a model of faith, but Rahab. And a lot of other pretty shady characters that we would never have nominated. I mean, what church nominating committee would have nominated half the list in Hebrews 11? Fortunately, the Lord is much more generous than we are, which is why I'm so glad he runs the judgment and we don't judge each other. The, he's very gracious. And that's why when he says, there's no way I can let that person in, there really is no way. Because he could find a way to let Rahab in and Gideon and Jephthah and Samson and a lot of other people who have quite a record. So when the infinitely generous one says, I cannot support that person, uh, he is not safe to save. You know, there really is nothing he could say. Well, what else in, we just have a minute or two, what about the request to Abraham to sacrifice his son? What would that say about God? Well, what should we do with a story like that? It's a terrific story. Uh, if we can put it in the total setting, Abraham was God's friend. Look at their conversations. But did Abraham let God down? Was there a breach of trust between them from time to time? Did Moses let God down too? All of us have sinned and come short, including his best friends in the Bible, Moses and Abraham. Abraham, you remember, was afraid for his wife, and he said she was his sister. Well, in certain ways she was, so that is the palest white lie you could possibly tell. But it isn't, um, it isn't whether it was pale or black that counted. The point was Abraham did not trust God to look after them. And God was saying, this marvelous Abraham, he's trusted me in so many ways. And he was speaking with pride of Abraham before the heavenly family. Does God like to speak with pride of his trusting children? How about Job? God announced even to the enemy, there's a perfect and an upright man who will never let me down. We don't give God much pleasure in speaking with pride of his children, but people like Abraham did. And then Abraham let God down. And God was challenged now, can I use patriarchs and prophets? Maybe not for all of us, but certainly within the family, what a shame to waste it. It's a great story even without this, but to add it, the accuser of the brethren has accused, you remember Joshua the high priest and Job and many other people, he accused Abraham. And he accused God of regarding Abraham as a trustworthy friend, just as he accused God of trusting Job. Now, would God just say, but uh, Abraham is a good man. Yes, he has some failings. What did he do with Job? Did he say, Satan, you're wrong. Job is a good man. Or did he say, you may test Job to the limit, and Job will not let me down. In many and various ways, God offers evidence. In this case, he asked Abraham to sacrifice his son. What a test. 
And Abraham thought, I think, not so much of his understanding, thou shalt not kill. He understood it meant thou shalt not murder, and he loved his son. The real problem was God had given him this son miraculously to be the father of the faithful, the only boy he had. And it meant everything to him that he'd have a son who'd be the progenitor of the faithful all down through the years. And God said, take that son, your only son, and sacrifice him. And Abraham's first thought was, that makes no sense at all. He gave me this son and now says, sacrifice him? But then he thought about it. The God I've known through the years has always made sense. I know this will, though I can't see it now. So God, I'm on my way. But do you mind if I ask you questions on the way? He thought it was too much for Sarah. Now, Sarah's in the chapter on models of faith, which is very generous of God, because you remember when he said, you'll have a baby, she laughed. And God said, why did you laugh? She said, I didn't laugh, you know. And God put her in Hebrews 11. Well, look. Under the circumstances, would you have laughed? <laughs> you know, I think God was very sympathetic that Sarah laughed. I mean, it was incredible, wasn't it? So he didn't hold that against her. But Abraham knew that it would be too much for Sarah to say, I'm going to take our promised son out and sacrifice him. So he didn't wake her up. And he didn't tell Isaac. He just said, Isaac, we're going out to sacrifice. And Isaac liked to go with his dad. He was a big boy by then. He could have resisted, as you know. But he went with his father. And while Isaac slept those three nights, Abraham got not a wink of sleep. He spent three days and three nights asking God why. This is the one who could say to God, I know you wouldn't destroy Sodom and Gomorrah. You'd do what's right and so forth. A friend like Moses who would say, God, you wouldn't do something that would confuse people as to your reputation. These are God's friends. And Abraham is puzzled. But the book of Hebrews says that Abraham thought it through and said, if God could give me that boy miraculously, he could resurrect him, couldn't he? Or he could provide a substitute. These were Abraham's conclusions. And the Bible says Abraham was right. Ellen White adds a little note that as Abraham approached the mountain, he said, God, I've thought that through and I'm willing to do it. But you, just a little itty bitty sign, maybe, you know. I mean, normally when you have that much faith, you don't need signs like Gideon's fleece, the wet one and the dry one. And God gave him a, a light over the mountain. You remember the story in Patriarchs and Prophets? God's very gracious. Uh, if we need even that kind of a help when the pressure is enough. That wasn't the best evidence, though. Just a little help. The real evidence was what Abraham knew to be true about God. And he went ahead with it. And sure enough, God provided a substitute. But God turned to the heavenly council and said, Any more questions about my friend Abraham? Silence, Satan. Don't you dare accuse him again. He has proved that he trusts me. So that was a very important moment in Abraham's life and also in the history of the universe. And we're told that if we let God down, he'll bring us over the same ground again and again. Until we too, hopefully, will overcome and demonstrate that we too can be trusted in that regard. And then maybe the next one and the next one. So God was, was uh, instructing Abraham, disciplining him, making him even greater person. And God could then speak with great pride of his friend Abraham. Well, it's nine o'clock. We must try to stop on time because there's no way to stop uh, without it being arbitrary. You understand? I mean, if we did it naturally, we go on all night with the things in here. But fortunately, we have another opportunity every Wednesday night. And the same questions arise uh, time after time in the books. The very same ones. Just different illustrations of the same points. So we could afford to close at nine, leaving many things yet to be considered. And I would welcome your suggestions, by the way, as to what would be the most useful way to do it. I, I very much appreciate your comments. I hope I can say less as time goes on. I just am eager we get off to a good start here and see what significant things there are to talk about. If you only had Genesis, would you love, admire, and trust God? What if we couldn't understand the flood quite? Would you be willing to wait for clarification? The one who sees the little sparrow fall, how do you think he felt as babies drowned in the flood? He must have hated every horrible moment. How it grieved him. 
Will all people who drowned in the flood be lost? Who says so? Maybe a little girl was begging her daddy, please take me to the boat, and he never took her there. We have no word that all who are drowned will be lost. We have no message that all who are in the ark will be saved, right? We don't have that message. God saved everybody who got on the boat, that's all. How he must have wished to build a whole fleet of Queen Mary's. But God knew he only needed a little boat. By the way, does that suggest that God even knows our future decisions? How did God know they only needed a little boat? And there was plenty of room, wasn't there? And I think that's part of the evidence that God indeed does know of our future decisions. Do you like living with a God who knows how we're going to vote in the future? Only if he's the gracious God that some of us believe him to be. I'm not afraid of God's infinite power. He'd never abuse it. I'm not afraid of his infinite memory. He's eager to treat us as if we'd never sinned. I'm not even afraid of his infinite knowledge of the future. If he knows I'm going to be lost, and this is the only life I'm going to live, he'll make it as pleasant as possible. He even washed the feet of Judas the night before he betrayed him, and he knew he was going to, and yet he washed his feet. And he was so gracious to Judas that when Judas left the supper, the other disciples thought he'd gone to make an offering to feed the poor. That's how God treats even his children he knows cannot be saved. That's the kind of person God is. Not nice to his good children and harsh to his bad children. He loves all his children. It will grieve him greatly when some he has to give up and they will die to be sure. But Genesis raises that question. What does God do to his children who will not love him and love each other? Does he say, you either love and obey me or look out. I will really get you in the end. That destroys love. And so we now need to look through Exodus and Leviticus and Numbers and Deuteronomy and see if the whole sacrificial system speaks clearly to this. Well, if it was really clear, there'd be no need for Jesus to come later and really die that death. It's just a holding action. God the teacher is using all kinds of emergency methods to hold us until the day when he would come and personally answer the questions. So everything builds up to the, to the cross, doesn't it? Well, should we pray before we go? Our loving Father in heaven, we love to recall the beauties in the beginning, how magnificent our world, and how magnificent our first parents. And no blemish, no sin, perfect loyalty, and the freedom thou didst give them. To think that thou hast shared with us some of thy creative power. We're not quite sure how we do it, but um, we seem to create little people in our own image as thou hast done. We're grateful that thou hast shared this marvelous ability with us. And then we think back to the first Sabbath and how thou hast asked us please not to forget all that thou didst do that week to reveal the truth about thyself. And then we remember how we let thee down. And yet thou didst not abandon us. Thou didst not leave us to die. Who would have missed this little planet? And yet we think of all that thou hast done through the years. How disloyal even thy chosen people have often been. How when Jesus finally came to those who should have known him the best, they tortured him to death. Would we do any better now? We pray that as we go through the whole Bible again, our whole perspective may be um, made clearer and made larger, and we may see ourselves at the present time in this whole larger setting and see how important our decisions are now. And yet we know thou dost not ask us to decide without sufficient evidence. And with what patience and at what cost Thou hast demonstrated the truth about thyself. And how hard of hearing we have been. We thank thee for raising thy voice so frequently, even shaking the ground beneath us to get our attention, even sending she-bears as need be. Whatever is necessary, because apparently we, thy sinful children, mean that much to thee. And thou art not willing that any of us should be lost, and so thou dost wait. 
we understand we're clear down at the end of this whole experience. And we have more evidence than anyone else in all history, the accumulated evidence of the centuries. How could we come to false conclusions about thee? Or worse, how could we know all this and yet not be loyal to our God? So we do pray that this experience may increase our love, our trust, our admiration for thee and thy wise and gracious ways to so change us as we come to know thee better that we will be better witnesses for thee to other people that would really love to know this picture. And we know it, and we're not telling it to them. And thou art waiting. So may our study together help us. We pray in Jesus' name.